Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. Welcome back to another episode of the Tim Tim Nifties with Steve and Greg. No, uh, Steve, we are doing another type of podcast intro today, being Tim Ferriss. We have some Tim Ferriss NFT news hot off the press, we believe. We're like sort of, what, 87% sure that this is legit at Tim Tim Nifties. Welcome to episode 20, I should say, too. Yes, welcome. Episode 20, wow. Wow. I, I, I'm just so impressed every time we have an episode. I don't know why <laughs> it happens every week, but yeah, big news is the Tim Tim Nifty is real. I, as you said, 87% convinced it is. Um, I checked the Twitter profile and it is followed by some very big names in NFTs. And then you looked at Kevin Rose's uh, Twitter and he did retweet um, a quote from the Twitter profile. So very interesting. I have turned on notifications for that because likely it could be a, a free mint at a random time. So we'll we'll see what happens with that. Very interesting. Good to see Tim Tim um, having some NFTs. Uh, yes, shout out to uh, to Tim Tim. So we've got the, the uh, latest. I'm a regular listener too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. He is. Um, text me all the time, just a couple of little tips on how we can improve, etc. So there was quite an extensive list. But yeah, you mentioned that there was some quite some big accounts. Uh, I actually can see that um, the 37th most influential Twitter presence at day 25 <laughs> seems to be following this account. At I, Tim I, I Tim think that's Nifty, long so... gone. I, I think I might be 237 now. <laughs> I haven't tweeted in a while. Well, we've got a, the, the most recent tweet from uh, yesterday it says, to get the news when I reveal more, please follow this placeholder account at Tim Tim Nifties, so N-I-F-T-I-E-S, and t at T Ferris, which is his main account. The profile illustration doesn't necessarily reflect project art, but I dig it. So um, this would ov obviously not be Tim Tim's first <laughs> NFT, though, because he did an uh, NFT course. art drop. Um, cool proof with grails number one back in sort of February, March. But uh, yeah, I am very, very uh, interested in this. I have followed the account uh, and I'll be looking on um, and trying to get as much alpha as I can uh, in the proof yeah. proof discord. So if I hear anything, I'll obviously let all of our <clears throat> wonderful ape and bird listeners know first. Yeah, I, I'm going to assume it's going to be more art-based. Uh, we know he used to be, well, not used to be an artist, but does love art, drawing, and so on. And I remember years ago, he tried to start a community, a paid community, and he ended up hating it. So I can't see this being a utility token uh, that gives you access to a Discord or anything like that. I believe it will be art-based. But we'll, probably knowing Tim... Uh, something with AI, of course, we've seen a lot of uh, Dali stuff and all the other AI art. So it's going to be interesting to see what he comes up with. And I'm sure it will uh, go up in value very quickly and getting one of those NFTs is probably going to be very difficult, but very profitable if you do get on a whitelist. Yes, I would agree so. So let's uh, let's segue from Tim Tim Nifties into Steve. Uh, our merge, merge, our, merges. our bags are sort of slowly bleeding still <laughs> from uh, the the rapid incline. Price it's a of, deep wound. It is a deep wound, <laughs> but our bags did not go to zero. Our JPEGs are still alive. Yet. We had a successful merge. What half an hour, forty five minutes after we recorded <laughs> our show. Last week, you text me with the link of the, the YouTube uh, live where you had all of the uh, Ethereum Foundation devs, etc., sort of on there talking things through. It was fascinating. I, I watched it for probably a good 45 to 60 minutes. Um, what about yourself? How did you sort of just uh, find the whole um, – I mean, it was, a, it was a pretty big achievement. Yeah, and it worked. And like we said last week, nothing at all changed apart from the price. But it, it worked. Uh, they validated new nodes on the proof of stake chain. Uh, it was it was interesting seeing how big of a team and how many people were involved. Uh, so yeah, we're now a proof of stake, just like every single other apart from Bitcoin. So in in a sense, ETH has lost one of its core features. Uh, and now it really is competing against everything else. So Solana, 
Um, what else have we got? There, there's so many. I, I, I don't even think about them. But now it is on a level playing field. So all these other layer ones are really going to have to work hard to prove why they should be used over Ethereum. What One of the staggering um, sort of stats or tweets that I saw actually shortly following the merge, and I think Vitalik um, tweeted this out, but it wasn't a quote from him. It was a quote from um, one of the other Giga brains that, that was part of this. I saw um, this one. Yeah. Uh, and look, I, I've... I am a believer in climate change, not to get too far away from our podcast topic here. What I don't like is the hysteria and the sort of the, the, the bias FUD that is thrown at certain topics, you know, like when I've heard certain things like over the journey that sort of like, well, we should just ban crypto because of the climate impact. And then someone will counter that with, well, we're going to tell everyone to turn their Christmas lights off Christmas around lights, the world. Christmas lights, that's yeah. the famous so, one that I was Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the hysteria or just the, the sort of... Um, yeah, just the sort of biased opinions where you just you're pigeonholing one particular thing. Having said that, I sort of was taken back a little bit by this quote where it said essentially Ethereum was taking up 0.2% of the world's energy in the proof of work um, consensus me mechanism, which is obviously mm -hmm. in the in the history books now. Bitcoin apparently still takes 0.5%. <laughs> Uh, percent, and when you think about the world's energy, that is actually a staggering amount. I mean, I would look. Maybe I was a little bit blind to that stat previously, but I had never seen that th stat thrown ar around, right? And I actually think that's a really good metric to go by to give broader context of what what energy consumption does something actually take up. And I think when you think about 0.2 percent of the entire world's um, energy use is is I'm pretty sure what the the tweet I saw. So uh, I yeah I was quite taken back by that stat, and I'm glad that it's moved over. And as we've said multiple times on this uh, show before, Steve, this is going in my opinion to open up a lot of or unlock open a lot of doors. I should say from a traditional business standpoint, dipping their toe, experimenting in NFTs. And I think it's going to be really important for Ethereum because all of a sudden um, the, you know, the knee jerk reaction to no, we're not going to deploy on Ethereum um, because of ESG concerns is now out the door. So congratulations to uh, all uh, the people that were involved with that um, just amazing technological feat. Yeah. So, Agree totally, um, but to defend Bitcoin a bit here with their 0.5% energy use, you then need to break that down into sort of fossil fuels, reusables, vented gas, all these other type of um, uses, not uses, but electricity how, how and how it's generated. So I don't know the numbers, but I do know that Bitcoin is very green in the energy that it does use. Uh, so that 0.5, yes, of the total, but then what percent would just be wasted anyway and so on. But fantastic that ETH now can say, look, we are just like running a heap of servers, just like AWS. If you, if you want to shut us down, shut the internet down or eat much smaller things as well. So, yeah, it's yeah. going to allow, as you said, a lot of companies to come into the space without one more worry. Yeah, completely agree. And I think um, I am no uh, energy source expert, but um, these are all, <laughs> even, all right. even, even from a Bitcoin standpoint, right, these are solvable problems. <clears throat> Um, and we know that there's there's people working on these too. So, uh, congratulations for an excess, successful uh, merge. Should we uh, segue into uh, weekend action at Gold Coast? Yes, you were lucky enough to head up to the Gold Coast. I was stuck in here working as I am every single day. <laughs> um, but let us know about Oz CryptoCon and how it went, how your talk went, uh, and I guess a few of the parties afterwards too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Really good event. I enjoyed it. Um, it was uh, two days, Saturday, Sunday. Um, there was quite extensive lines on the Saturday. I think a few people struggled to get in for the Michael Saylor talk, which was via video. Um, I was able to get my sort of uh, speaker credentials a little bit quicker um, than, the, than the regular line. I will say, though, that any conference you go to that's got couple of thousand people um you know the first morning registration is always a headache 
happened at uh, Consensus, happened at NFT NYC when I was there. So, you know, if you're ever going to a conference and you can get your pass the day before, which I believe they did have it open from four to eight on the Friday, um, highly encourage you to do that. But look, I, th- I, I enjoyed the time. It was good to sort of... Um, it was good to catch up with people that you sort of have interactions with on Twitter and Discord. I met a few people for the first time. So people like Friendly Jameson, who I've been, you know, having voice discords with for over 12 months. And, um, you know, I actually had dinner with him and his wife, Renee, who's the community manager at BFF on the Friday I night. You've, I believe you are got a Twitter spaces tonight with him. Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. So I'm rolling one one media into the next uh, this evening. But, um, yeah, so, look, it was a great weekend. Uh, I think my talk on Saturday uh, was pretty well received. Um, I got to say that I, I really pushed myself to try to do something different, and I was a little bit underprepared because we had a big week, obviously, of NFT Fest announcements last week. So the time I had allocated to that, um, I felt like I was just sort of, you know, battling a little bit. And I, I did practice it on one or two people uh, sort of, you know, one or two days before. And I got met with a lot of uh, FUD. I, I even think I got a <laughs> comment like, that was terrible. Do you want me to give you like this? <laughs> so, but I got to say, when I got up there on stage and was able to uh, ad lib a little bit and feel the energy of, uh, of the people, I probably had about, I don't know, let's call it 100, 120 people at, at my session. Um, so... You know, I think it was really good. The weekend was good. Um, you know, the parties were, were fun. Um, I, mm-hmm. I think whenever you have it as a destination, when you have a conference at a destination um, place like Gold Coast, right, you're going to get people that are enjoying themselves, whether that means, <laughs> you know, going to every single content session or not. But I, I got to say, I had a lot of good relationships formed on the weekend. I had a few people come up to me that I hadn't met before after my talk. I had coffee with them and I hope to get many of those involved in NFT Fest in a couple of months as well. Yeah. And I heard that you met one of our three listeners as well at the event. One of our three listeners. <laughs> so I met, well, I met a few of our listeners, actually. It's, it's, it was quite surprising when I had a few people say, I'm a regular ape and bird listener. I thought, geez, you know, you're not Steve's mum or my mum. This is, this is incredible. Um, no, but uh, one one in particular, I had a great chat with her. Her name is Tracy Plowman. She's from uh, a crypto app called Bamboo. And so Tracy is uh, definitely got degen tendencies, or let's just call her a degen. She loves her NFTs. Um, so I had a really good chat with, with Tracy. And um, yeah, shout out, Tracy. We obviously know you're listening now. So <laughs> shout out to Tracy. Uh, the other person that you may have spent some time with was Ben Simpson. And I saw a tweet of his where, did he end up picking up the bill at one of the tab, uh, the tab at one of the bars? Yeah. So Ben from the Collective Shift, um, I've done a, a, a couple of little videos for Collective Shift and there, shout out to Matt Williamson that was up there from Collective Shift too. Ben, uh, ben decided that he would put on a happy hour type uh, drinks from I think it was about 4.30 to 6.30 or 7 on the Sunday. It was actually at a great venue. It was um, James Squire type of um, venue. Uh, really, really fun. He picked up the bar tab. Um, just before we actually throw to something, Steve, I just wanted to tell you that Ben essentially nearly died at his own event on Sunday. What? He he ate a chip. I'm going to exaggerate just a, a fraction here. <laughs> but he was choking on a chip. And there was a few people that rushed to his uh to his need and were sort of hitting him quite hard on the back, trying to uh just help him cough it up. Um and I'd had, you know, maybe two or three beers and made the comment to a few people like, Don't let him die, who's gonna pay for the beers? So he was uh, <laughs> and then was starting to scheme of who who might get his moonbird. So uh yeah, shout <laughs> shout out to Ben. But then then I um Ben definitely had a quite a large evening on Sunday and I was I was there with him um, you know most of the way uh, but I, I actually saw he he records his own podcast called the Ben and Berg show and um, talking about cramps can we just throw to that video because um, I don't know if we've ever had a moment like this on our pod Steve but this, this oh, we've is, been close this on is, my end this is one of the all-time funny uh, funny clips if we can bring it up. Yeah, I'm going to play it now. Oh, hold on one second. Of course, tech difficulties by me, and I'm going to play it now. One, a cheese and ham one, a cake one, and something oh. else. Oh. What? Chris! <laughs> 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 
So, so Steve, I would say that's probably the result of, uh, you know, maybe like, you know, six tequila shots and uh, 10 beers and, no you know, water. four G&Ts with no water till, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning and then getting up and deciding to uh, to uh, do a podcast. So uh, shout out to, uh, to Ben. I have already <laughs> um, aggressively screenshotted a lot of those individual frames. So you can imagine where I'm going with those particular frames. So, yeah. So Ben, you Surely are in a lot of trouble. An... <laughs> Surely that's going to be an NFT one day. <laughs> uh, uh, I know, I know Ben's pain when I used to play soccer our training would always end when I would cramp up, which was very early in the training. And the worst ever was when I had a double cramp and I still feel that pain to this day. So hopefully Ben's had a bit of magnesium in him now and he's okay. Oh, yeah. And um, I should say too, if, you, if you're on audio only, uh, go to our Twitter page. We'll make sure we retweet that video that we've just oh, shown yeah. on our uh, video version. <laughs> so uh, yeah, look, wrapping up uh, Oz CryptoCon, great event. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun. Uh, <clears> it was obviously the last thing I'd say on it was sort of a bit of a mixed bag in terms of attendees. But I think that was always going to be the case in terms of you had people that were there sort of Bitcoin maxis, you had people that were on the traditional sort of um, crypto trading side, you had DeFi um, interest, you had NFTs, Metaverse, you sort of just had a real big mixed bag. But I think it was great to uh, to interact with everyone. And like I said, a lot of good relationships uh, formed and just a, a nice excuse to ex- escape Melbourne for me in particular for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So just as we end that, is there any NFT Fest news over the past week? Uh, nothing we can share right now. This time next week on our show, we will have a venue announced and we will hopefully have, um, I'm in currently in a lot of discussions with uh, potential speakers, also some potential sponsors. Um, I'm very, very confident we're going to put on a really great show, um, you know, two-day <laughs> event um late november uh if you're tuning in for the first time uh or you haven't heard previous announcements around nft fest nftfest.com.au you can pre-register for tickets now so uh we will have a lot coming down the barrel in the coming weeks steve so very very exciting awesome yeah awesome now let's move on to our weekly news what's been happening in nft world OpenSea. They've done something. The developers have done stuff. Um, they've introduced their new UI, uh, which shows hold account percentage, percentage listed, uh, shows a few other things. And they've also released Open Rarity, which is a joint venture between a few different uh, projects. And today, I think three separate projects actually added it to their pages. So I went to the Moonbirds and I could see their open rarity score. Uh, really interesting. What do you think of the new look? And then I might talk a little bit about open rarity on NF Teams. We've created our own rarity site, um, but this is a pretty good new addition to NFTs, I feel. Yeah, I like it. I like all of these um, additions. I think, um, you know, I used to know where to find this information anyway, and I'm sort of almost in this habit, right, of uh, of finding certain metrics, um, you know, o- over over many months and sort of almost years now of, of searching OpenSea. But I like it. It's just that all there, like the percentage of uh, percentage listed, I should say, and the percentage of unique holders. I think that's a that's a good one. Um, yep. I, I do want to throw it back to you on the rarity one. I was actually quite taken back a little bit today when, um, you know, I use NFT nerds um, a little okay. bit, uh, but also I've used uh, rarity tools over the the journey. Um, what's another one? Uh, <coughs> we've got like Trait Sniffer, Trait Sniper, all of these type of, of tools that have come in and out of my collecting, uh, you know, radar over the last um, 18 months. But a lot of the rankings that I've got for my NFTs, including my Cool Cat and my Moonbirds, et cetera, um, they are uh, way out on the uh, – and not a, and not in a good way for me. Like, so, for instance, <laughs> my my Moonbirds hoodie one, the one that is on the icon of our show, the, uh, the uh, thumb, thumbnail, that ranked, I think, something like in the 3,000s on 
OpenSea's new tool, but on NFT nerds, it's like top 1200. So there's a big discrepancy in a number of, um, in a number of the uh, NFTs that I own. And, and like I said, not, not in my favor. <laughs> so what's, <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts? Have you played around with some yeah. of the ones you own? Uh, not yet, because I don't own any of the ones that they've thrown up. But rarity is a really tough one. Um, and as you mentioned before, we had, even for NFTs, we tried to get on Rarity Sniper and Rarity Tools. And back then, you had to pay two ETH just to get listed on these platforms. Uh, so this, for one, having an open standard, fantastic. It's going to save projects a lot of money. Fair enough, that's gone down over the past year. Uh, but it just depends what their algorithm is. And you can play with the algorithm to get things right or wrong. And Rarity Sniper, when we had paid them, they initially worked with me to figure out the best sort of look. So it was all just like what seems to be rare um, and so on. And then the, I remember the first version we put on NFTs when they could go to Rarity Sniper or whatever the Discord channel was, they were just so angry that we had to redo Rarity again. And then eventually it got to a stage where they were just angry with the rarity across all of these different platforms that we made our own rarity tool. Uh, and that came out and people were more happy. But it's it, it's so difficult because, it, look, on rarity tools, my golden ape is ranked like 150. So it, in my mind, I would say my apes are top 100 at least, maybe top 50 because it's gold and there's only 40 of those. It's a seven trait, uh, which there's no other gold that's seven trait, blah, blah, blah. You could go on and try to find a reason why yours should be rarer than another. So this open rarity, it, it's just if we can find a standard, that's okay. But there's always going to be how things look, which you can't really quantify. Um, and just a general community behind things like a hoodie. I know on CryptoPunks, a hoodie is fairly common, but yet they sell for much higher than other traits that are less. And it's just because the community has been built up around that. And I know with Moonbirds, you guys have so many different communities mm. uh, based around traits. So it's good to have a overall one that sort of puts all the... Uh, all collections on a level playing field so you can get an idea. But yeah, rarity is something that will never be solved properly, uh, but it's good to have that open standard. I, I actually like the fact that it can't be solved by just like a bailout number. Like I think um, understanding that if you have a hoodie up me bit, the floor on those are ridiculous compared to its overall rarity, right? And then obviously yep. like I actually have... Um, this was the the second me bit I bought back in uh, late May or early June. I bought it for one point four nine ETH. This is in twenty twenty one, and on Rarity Tools uh, version one, it's the it's in the top hundred. It's eighty second, cool. I think it is right. But I know for a fact that robots, um, you know, even pigs, right, in terms of the types they will go higher than it unless I get someone that just loves it aesthetically because it is good aesthetically, but it's got a number of traits. It's got a, you know, um, basketball singlet. It's got a camo, like blue camo jacket. It's got all these things. And when I was first getting into NFTs, I was like, oh, wow. And I sniped it because I saw it was in the top 100. And, and I still got a good price for it. I think it's still a great buy. Oh, now, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I also, <clears throat> um, if you're going purely by rarity and not understanding the nuances and the culture of sort of A, NFT cryptos in general, or B, what the collection desirability is of the community, um, I, I like it from that perspective, right? It, ke it, keeps an, it keeps an edge to it. And I, I like that. I think otherwise we become too methodical, too vanilla, too boring. <laughs> Exactly. And the other thing is that we've seen lately that if it's not a really rare one, it, you can say it's a flaw. There, the compression between the flaw and maybe 60 to 70% of the collection is very tight. And then it's that few 5% that are really rare that have a lot more value over the flaws, but everything else is very close. So as always, just buy what you like, really, as long as it's a fair price, you can afford it. And yeah, enjoy it. Because 
yeah, I don't think there's going to be all that many people in the future that care rarity between like one and 8,000. Well, the the other example too is um, in the board ape system, like, you know, merch, merch apes, right? Where, where you've got cap or a t-shirt, but then the double merch apes, like, you know, yeah. uh, BBA.eth. Um, uh, um, what, what was that short for? Boring, boring board ape. Dot ETH. So um, he's actually one of the like co-founders or behind the scenes of the World of Women project. Um, I remember having interactions with him and uh, he has like the hat and the, the T-shirt combo, right? And I think that that is only like 8,000 or 9,000 ranking, but he can command a higher price because aesthetically and being a double merch ape. So, yeah. And But then there's also the fact that Board Ape Yacht Club allow you to use that logo as long as it's attached to your ape. Yes. So that's an extra thing as well of that. So, yeah, they're really interesting. We'll see. I, I did try to go and add it to the NFTs collection. There is a, if you go into collection on OpenSea, you can click a toggle, but it wouldn't let me toggle because there is something I need to do in the metadata apparently, so I'll have to look into that. But it would be good to get that up on OpenSea as soon as possible for NFTs. Absolutely. All right. Oh, before we move on to the next one, just next week we should have um, some news for NF teams. Uh, I think it's a NFT first, uh, but we'll see. So, yeah, next week you've got some news and I'll have some news. I am very much looking forward to it, um, and I say this often on the show, but you and your project NF teams have been grinding away and done a lot of things that we often see tweets about sort of like, Oh, wow, this project did this as a first or imagine if you could actually have real utility or be doing something. And I think I saw you tweet today about, you know, essentially having your NF teams tournaments, which uh, real cash prizes have been up for grabs for nearly a year now. Um, so yeah. I think you were, was that a Cantina quote, Cantino, Chris Cantino? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. He, he yeah. had asked for projects with utility. Yeah. Yeah. So no, very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing more from, from you next week around the, uh, the updates yeah. with NF teams. Uh, uh, over the next couple of months, we'll be re releasing a lot more info. Um, and yeah, can't say too much now, but yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll keep talking about it on future episodes. Love now it. we're talking about sports NFTs. Let's talk about the Chicago Bulls who teamed up, I think with Coin Jar, no, Coin Spot, what, who, Coinbase, what Coinbase, of course. There's so many Coin um, ones, and was it 23? I'm guessing because of Jordan. Yep. So 23 separate artists to recreate their version of the Bulls logo. Uh, I've seen a fair few of them. This is a cool project that brings a sporting team and NFTs together, and we go on nonstop how sports and NFTs just make sense. Yep. Um, so this is an interesting one. Have you looked at them? Which was your favorite? Uh, tell us a bit more about this collab between the Bulls and the NFT space. Yeah, well, I think, you know, some of the more notable names that were um, involved, and as the, the Bulls have, have done it in some creative copy here, they talk about our artist roster, but, you know, some that jump off the page to me, Dead Fellas, um, you know, Ghost. I love that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you've got uh, Claire Silver. Um, you know, so so there's there's a number of um, – oh, I should say Bobby Hundreds as well, right? Yeah, so I saw that a, one. I, yeah. So, I, I own some Bobby Hundreds, but I wasn't a huge fan of that one. Yeah. So, no, I, I like the Dead Fellas one too. Um, I, I actually uh, sort of missed the Ghost wave in 2021. I just have um, – the only exposure to Ghosts I have is the Ghost Comics Volume 1, and I think that gives me a Volume 2 whenever that comes out. But uh, I like that one. I, I just like that style of, of art. It does resonate with me. But I think, um, you know, importantly that this is just another example of how, um, you know, brands and, and culture, I would say, is, is starting to really um, immerse itself in sort of this Web Web 3 um, ecosystem. Um, so, you know, I, I, I liked it. Um, if I read a little bit here, Steve, they're going for sort of auction. Um, so it talks about we've asked 23 of the most creative artists in Web3 to reinterpret and reimagine the Bulls logo. So the result, you know, being 23, as you mentioned, one of one NFTs. Um, and this, this uh, official collaboration between the artists and the Bulls, there'll only ever be 23 of them. Um, the auction starts actually tomorrow our time. So Thursday 
uh, September 22nd American time. The starting price is going to be 0.2 ETH, so pretty reasonable in terms of the starting price. Um, but bids will be submitted in increments of 0.1. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what what do you think out of um, what's going to be the highest final sale price out of those 23 one of ones? Oh, probably 23 ETH. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, this market, I don't know all the artists involved. I haven't looked at it enough. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say the minimum price is probably going to be one or two ETH on a few of them, but depending on the artist, we can see some in the 20s, 30s, maybe even 40, 50s. Uh, but really interesting that Coinbase is doing this, of course. I think they're a major sponsor of the NBA season yes. coming up. Yep. Uh, they yep. already have been for a few years. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and also Coinbase News is they're now becoming, we know how poorly received their NFT platform was, probably the most hyped thing last year uh, and every single project was trying to get featured on Coinbase. I had about three or four calls with Coinbase to get NFTs on there and each meeting it started with one and then two, then six people, then 10 people and I thought I was close and then they just stopped talking. <laughs> Nothing happened of it and I was like, oh damn, that would have been really cool. And then it launched, completely flopped. I don't, I, I think their turnover is minuscule at the moment, but they released news today that they're sort of going to become an aggregator. So now, because no one's listing on Coinbase, OpenSea, Looks Rare, and a few other platforms are going to be on Coinbase as well. So in Australia, we've got CoinSpot NFT, uh, which NF Teams is on and they just aggregate all these different platforms as well. So this might be Coinbase waving the white flag and saying, well, but we didn't do so well. We're just going to see what else we can do. They did have a few unique uh, things with being able to type under NFTs, so comment section, uh, creating your account and being able to use any name you wanted. Uh, but, yeah, after spending... the Apparently they paid the designer in stock that was worth nearly, I think I read half a billion dollars or close to, to design this platform. And yeah, it has not worked out well for them, but hopefully they can keep iterating and it finds its audience in due time. I agree. And um, I, I also uh, just wanted to sort of tie this in with this Bulls collaboration, but also, um, you know, my, my particular talk at, Oz CryptoCon, Steve, I forgot to tell you my, my sort of big analogy and, and uh, thing that I sort of uh, talked about, and I want to get your feedback, is I said, and I'd been thinking about it for a while, if hip hop brought storytelling and culture to disco, then I propose that NFTs brought storytelling and culture to crypto. What do you think about that when you hear that? Yeah, it's quite interesting. It is. So... I, I like that because crypto's always been looking for a reason and you can't really sell a story around um, sending someone some money or something like that. So NFTs, and we know that storytelling in NFTs is a big thing at the moment, but on the bigger side of it, the fact that NFTs proved the case and proved that you can tell stories about art or utility and something using crypto. Yeah, very interesting. Good good observation there. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, anyway, I won't hog any more of the spotlight. I just uh, realized I didn't <laughs> actually uh, – I buried the lead when you asked me about uh, Oz Crypto uh, Convention before. So um, let's talk about uh, the comeback of Azuki. Do you have any yeah, Azuki, by uh, the way? No, I would never buy one. Okay. What about you? No, I don't have any Azuki. I, I got close before before we heard about um, all the founder drama. I, I quite liked the aesthetics of them, but um, no, they ran up on me too quick and I, I felt like I missed the boat, but yeah. Yeah, these were one of the first that had that is an anime aesthetic yep. sort of thing that people seem to really love. And then we've seen copy after copy. Uh, but then, of course, it came out that Zagabond uh, had run a number of projects and rugged all of them. 
And yeah, I I think we've talked about this on a much earlier episode, but the fact that he was forgiven simply because he's making people money, um, I think that's a bit shocking. But lately we've seen the price go back up. I'm hearing that they may have raised through VC funding at over a billion dollar valuation. Who knows if that's true? We've heard a lot of stories like that. A Even billion. With Ranga. Yes, but last week we saw that Doodles raised at over seven hundred million. Mm. So based on the price, if you're just basing simply on a floor price, Doodles were at seven. Azuki, what is it now? Twelve ETH. Is so it is it you, up to twelve? Back to twelve? Jeez. I think it's gone over ten or eleven. Um, so just based if you're if VCs are going as simple as um, floor price times collection and then giving a a multiplier on that. It could make sense. I, I think both valuations would are crazy, but if that does happen and they raise a hundred million, another big competitor in the space, we're seeing a lot of well, Moonbirds, Board AP ecosystem, Doodles, all with nearly fifty to a hundred million dollars, and of course, Board Eight with half a billion or more to spend. So the next few years are going to be very interesting. That's a lot of money, and they're going to be able to build some amazing things. So we'll have to wait and see if Azuki does get funding. Um, but then last week we talked about Renga. Uh, let, let's hear about what they're doing at the moment. Have you been keeping an eye on them? Uh, from a distance, I think we're at about a 0.85, 0.84 floor at the moment. Um I see a few uh, of the uh, sort of uh, usual suspects, um, you know, talking about Renga on uh, on Twitter. Um, I sort of, for uh, half a moment a few days ago, thought I might buy one, but I, I had to reassess and go, is it just because I just want to, I want to feel something you again, right? Like I want, I want, it was like this spree I went on <laughs> about a month ago where I just started minting a bunch of ENS names for like eight, <laughs> eight bucks a pop because I just wanted to see the MetaMask like transaction <laughs> confirm pop up. So I was like, <laughs> but so, I've been feeling the same. I, yeah. I tweeted out that like I miss minting things and the surprise. Um, would you have bought one of the boxes or uh, already revealed one? Cause you, remember boxes, I think got up to 2.5 ETH. And the Ranga floor got to, I, I think, 1.8 at one stage. So it's come down quite a bit. Uh, what is the box is at uh, 1.6 right now. Now, yeah. Um, I think in this market I would have bought one that was the cheaper option. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm, you're not a gambler. Uh, <laughs> I was a gambler. I was a gambler. <laughs> in in April, I've been... Uh, I've, <laughs> I've been pummeled to the ground since then. So I'm just licking my wounds still. <laughs> well, we can talk about how we've all been pummeled by the fact that the ETH price after the merge has absolutely crashed. Uh, I think at the merge, what was it, about 1600 1650 Are we talking? And, oh, oh, yeah, we're talking US. Yeah, no, yeah, US, yeah, yeah, yep. Yep. And now it's 1250 mm-hmm. uh, or thereabouts. And then we can, you had mentioned that it seemed that the NFT space was slowly rising again with uh, Board 8, Mutant 8 moving up. Yep. I think Mutants got to 15 E. They did. Um, I'm not sure where, where did Board Apes get to? Uh, Almost I, 80, I think. Yeah, I don't think they touched 80 again, but they're getting, they're getting quite close. Uh, they're at 77 right now. Okay. Yep. But of course, we know that it's correlated to the price of ETH. So... ETH dumping so much and these only going up a few ETH, it's probably fairly consistent. I I would really like a graph. I'm sure there are a lot of these sites that will show you in US dollars the price. Yep, yep. Um, Because it'll be interesting to see. NFT statistics, which I'm going to uh, butcher the handle here until I find it, but um, who is now on the proof payroll, but punk9059, so nftstatistics.eth, don't be confused either. Uh, He has a a, uh, female punk with pink hair, so it's a little bit confusing, but uh, his real name is Sam. He was on the, the future proof uh, announcement a couple of weeks ago, but uh, he tweets out USD prices quite often. 
Um, so okay. yeah, follow Punk uh, nine zero five nine, and you sometimes get some some good information there. But I'm sure there's a a tool there too, Steve, um, out there. But uh, I'm certainly not using it on a on a regular basis. Yep. All right. Well, let's end on one of your favorite projects and your ex PFP on Twitter. Yes. Cool Cats. They've announced some news. They had a town hall. Was it last week or this week? Let's hear the news and your thoughts. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, Cool Cats went, I think we're actually at three. Yes, we are at a floor price of three ETH. And only about two weeks ago, it touched about 1.9, I think. And I was like, wow, this is just an incredible, <laughs> incredible drop off. What did it get to at the high? Because it was going to be the next blue chip. It was in the board eight video of other deeds. Yeah, I, I would say um, eighteen comes to mind, but I think Ooh. it might have been even higher. Um, but yeah, eighteen wow. definitely comes to mind. What a crazy time last year was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we we have a new CEO. I'm going to say we do, we do. Um, still in the <laughs> the Cool Cats fam. Um, I was very impressed, as I mentioned, in New York with their activation. I thought it was one of the best ones. Um, so it is uh, Stephen Teglis, uh, who is great a, name. Yeah, Teglis, ex Disney Recore and Warner Brothers veteran. Um, so now stepping into the uh, the CEO role of Cool Cats, it's just going to be interesting, right? I think um, I think the game was a misstep, right? I think. Um, the, the, what was the game? Did you, you know, play it? I know they've got the milk token and they had Cooltopia, but I never, I'm not part of the ecosystem, so I never really looked into it. Uh, and they had cool pets and some other things. Yeah. So what was the game? Uh, well, this is, this probably sums it up for you. Um, in December or January this year, there was a lot like, Cool Cats for about a fortnight owned the attention of the NFT world. They really did because Cool Pets were coming. Um, there was quite a bit of debate around the mint price of Cool Pets. I think they ended up going for 0.5. So if you owned a Cool Cat, you got to claim a free Cool Pet. Um, but they went to market at a 0.5 ETH um, mint price for their other 10,000, 20,000 collection. Um, and we were hearing about Cooltopia is coming, Cooltopia is coming and Milk. I remember seeing all these tweet threads about, you know, if you own one cool cat and you do this <laughs> you and you do a million you, dollars you worth do of all the, kit. yeah, you do all these adventures, you'll make, you know, 300 bucks a week or 500 bucks a week or like whatever it was. And I claim my cool pet. I probably could have sold it for like two ETH, 2.5. Wow. It, ra it ran up a lot. Right. And these were unrevealed um, because it essentially it's the evolution of the cool pet. And then there was this game and they just had so much trouble shipping it, right, and getting it out the door. There was um, there was a tax on the Cooltopia site. I, I just remember it was just, yeah, it must have been so deflating for the founders and for the people working on it because it just felt like every time they went to start it, something wrong went or just something wasn't working. And to be honest, my attention it, it was funny when I think back, I hadn't thought about this before you asked me, Steve, but because I'd, I'd bought a proof pass in December, nothing happened with that until January. But January is very quiet. It was just it was just a very small discord. You were getting direct access to Kevin and the artist. It was fun, like I was in there. But the floor price of the proof pass was still, you know, two, three, four, e, something like that. It hadn't really moved. So my my attention was very firmly in the cool, like I was trying to dig and trying to work out about the Cool Cats ecosystem. And then it was almost like this sliding doors moment where I just got like, I don't know what's going on with Cool Cats. They sort of, they, they um, tapered off their communication a little bit. So I, I didn't want to sell my cat and I still have it to today. Um, but that was sort of coinciding with, um, you know, some initial proof drops. So my attention ended up going, over to proof and it really lost from the the cool cats ecosystem so um i just got you know sort of bored with it i suppose i didn't know what was so, going on are you telling me you never ended up playing this game or never, even been able to log in never played it look i'm sure i All yeah right. I, I, and, and it goes to i think just being involved in too many projects as well right like and and just um 
yeah, I had spent, I felt like enough hours trying to dig through and listen to all the town halls and work out what the hell was going on. Um, and it just coincided with my attention moving somewhere else. And then on top of that, you know, I was quite busy with blockchain week organizing that as well. So you only have so many hours in the day in bandwidth. Yes. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite interesting. I hadn't thought about it until you, until you asked me then, oh, but very um, interesting. I, I just think for cool cats, the play for them is they are, when you think about all the collections that are at that sort of mid tier or have touched <clears> on <throat> the top tier, which cool cats did touch on yeah, the top tier for, for many, many months um, throughout their run is they are a, f- a family friendly brand, right? And you saw that with their activation in, um, in New York. And I just think they got to double down on the IP and the brand itself and not get distracted by these like games that honestly, like, I don't know how, but like, what the percentage of holders would actually care to play the game, right? Like the only reason I would have been playing it is a, yes, I was curious and I'd like to do it once, but I don't want to play the game. I don't want to play the game. And then, yeah. And then it would be to, yeah, earn their milk token, which, you know, is, um, yeah, it's been stalled. So anyway. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with you. The art for cool cats is great. It's like, you can see that as a big kid's brand, cartoons, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, back onto, I think this is their probably second or third new CEO. I, I think that's always coming out. Uh, Steven, I forgot his last name. Te- Teglas. Teglas. But his last job was head of Recode, which, and we've talked about some of their past projects. They've worked with Nickelodeon. So it was the Rugrats, Care Bears, and a few other projects that were very hyped Um, And we mentioned Rugrats and how much you love that whole Rugrats thing, Uh, but their flaws have absolutely created because since the Mint, nothing has been done at all. Uh, So it could be a bit of a worry that this new CEO was part of a company that didn't work after a launch, Uh, but we'll just have to see. At least it gives Cool Cat holders hope. Um, It seems these sort of uh, announcements they pump the price and then it quickly people realize, well, it wasn't that big of an announcement and it goes back down, but we'll have to see. Maybe he's going to really, I, I saw his LinkedIn history and he's worked for Disney for 25 years. So he, he definitely has the experience and we'll just see what he, his contacts and what he can create. So hold the phone. I just heard you saw his LinkedIn experience. Now you have been a yes. well-known fudder of no, LinkedIn. No, no, no. Are you on the platform? Are you are you no, harnessing look. your inner boomer and you are back? <laughs> you are back no, no. on LinkedIn. I, I have a LinkedIn account. I've had one for a long time. I don't think there's much on there. I saw a photo on Twitter of his LinkedIn to be more specific. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to call you out there, just like you get to <laughs> dig in a little bit there on on, on LinkedIn. So, no, yeah. But like you said, I'm cl- getting closer and closer to uh, when we need to market these NF Teams players. I think LinkedIn could be the next big channel. So I, I'm starting to try to think how we could do something on LinkedIn to get people interested. Uh, so maybe I'll use you as a consultant for that because I know you love that site. It's your homepage. I, I, I look. There's no doubt that my feed uh, is, you know, LinkedIn is is being skewed towards Web three stuff. But I still have a lot of like ex colleagues or just people I've connected with in non Web three contexts pop pop into my LinkedIn feed. The interesting thing that I've noticed just in the last, say, call it two months at most, is all of the DGen talk, all of the NFT Twitter talk and language and slang is starting to creep in to nice. LinkedIn. And I love it, right? We're seeing like GMs, <laughs> we're seeing like NGMIs, <laughs> we're seeing all this stuff, right? And um, I like it because I think that people have a mask on when, they, when they're when they on LinkedIn, like a, this professional mask. And I just yeah. don't think it's overly necessary. And my big prediction is give it another 12 <laughs> to 24 months, LinkedIn is going to look not exactly like Twitter, but <laughs> but the, uh, is, the 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 language being used is going to be less formal, and I see crypto Twitter language infiltrating LinkedIn. Wow! Is your LinkedIn profile picture 
your pe- like is it just your face i am in a suit from from no no tie um i have thought about this a lot um in the height of just silliness of end of 2021 and it, probably even 2022 i think i changed it to my cool cap momentarily but you know, there's a lot of people that you don't have context on it, right? And I sort of, um, yeah, I decided to probably take the the easy way out and leave it as the suit picture, but I'm very open to switching it to my <laughs> Moonbird or something else. But um, unfortunately, well, uh, there's just not that Web3 context yet, I think, of, uh, of, of sort of pictures, right? So... Yeah. After this, I'll go into my LinkedIn for the first time in forever. I'm putting the gold ape as my profile picture. Lucky for me being an entrepreneur, I don't think I've worn a suit in 15 years. So that's good. Yeah. I, I think. Sorry, I was just going to say my my picture is actually a, a, one of those professional headshots. You will laugh when you see it. Uh, it was taken at a Telstra Vantage event, actually, I think back in 2019. So um, there you go. It's still my still my professional photo. <laughs> oh, I will say why, why we do, I know we've got to wrap up, but what you will <laughs> laugh at this and maybe it's you that's doing it. I don't know. I'm going um, to LinkedIn now. So, so yep. two, three hours after my presentation on uh Saturday in the Gold Coast, I had a fake Instagram spun up of me <laughs> right now. I don't even use Instagram that much at all. Um, and it was a, a board account and it had almost the same followers as I did. And it had copied literally every photo or video that I had posted. And this fake account, fake Greg, was DMing all of <laughs> fake my friends. Fake Greg was DMing all my friends. I was getting all these texts and um, screenshots on my Insta saying, is this you? And it would just start with like, hello, how are you? And then someone would go, oh, hey, Greg, or whatever back. And then they were trying to scam them with Bitcoin scams. Like, you know, like, yeah, 100%. So, so it, it likely was just someone at that conference going, well, these are all popular people. Let's just try to scam as many people as we can. Yeah. So very, very interesting, right? Like um, I'm still waiting. Well, no, I won't say it because it'll happen then, won't it? I was, yeah, no, I'll, I'll wow. keep, keep my uh, mouth, mouth I'm, shut. I'm on, your, I'm on your LinkedIn page. Um, <laughs> NFTs have aged us both. <laughs> was, that, was that 2019? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you're not that different. <laughs> but very, very nice um, pink shirt. Oh, there. thank you. Yeah. So it's a, sort of like is a, that a blue plaid. It's, it's, it's like the light pink on the Cool Cats logo. That was what, sort of what I was aim, <laughs> aiming for. So, Okay, we're waffling. We're, <laughs> we're done for this week. <laughs> That, that's everything we're going to talk we, about. We, we Episode didn't, 20 in the books. We didn't have on the docket that you were going to look up my LinkedIn and then sort of talk <laughs> about my dress sense. Um, uh, I'm going but, to send you some oh, – I'll hit your DMs up on LinkedIn. Yeah, well, I hope our new listeners that sort of – all the listeners that I met on the uh, the weekend, including uh, our friend Tracy, is uh, still, still going to tune in after our last five <laughs> minutes of just absolute bullshit. <laughs> It really was. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end it here. Have a great weekend. Um, long weekend, AFL final. I've got, I live in Wollongong, so we've got the UCI cycling championships. So I go out my front door and I see cyclists going by every minute. We can't drive anywhere. So enjoy your AFL grand final, yes. which the Swans will easily win because Melbourne can't really play AFL. Um, and I'll enjoy Shots fired. <laughs> and you enjoy your lycra. I will. <laughs> I sent you those pictures and I said not to share that. <laughs> we'll see you later. Wrapping think, up. See you later, everyone. I think we're done. <laughs> see you next week. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>